All right, welcome back. Um, we are now ready to start one of the most fascinating sessions VA Sustain, entitled Elephant in the Room, because demography is so obviously at the heart of sustainability, and yet it's very rarely presented in an environmentally themed event like EA Sustain. Paul Moreland is arguably the UK's top demographer. Um, he is the author of Tomorrow's People and The Human Tide, actually three books, uh, in demographic engineering. The Human Tide and Tomorrow's People, he, Paul will be available later to sign his book after you're wowed by this discussion. Um, and I, I actually came across Paul while listening to Moral Maze on BBC Four, but he has also been interviewed by the Financial Times, the Sunday Times, the Telegraph, the Toronto Globe and Mail, Der Spiegel, and again, BBC. Uh, finally, he's an associate research fellow at Birkbeck University of London and a senior member of, at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. Now, Paul, we have, again, like similar to Dogger, the Doggerland discussion, we have a really dense um, and a, a big mother load of material to, to cover. So this book, <coughs> just to explain a little bit, uh, is divided into 10 chapters, each dedicated to a specific de de theme of demography. And I'm just going to recite it very quickly. Infant mortality, population growth, urbanization, fertility, aging, old age, population decline, ethnic change, education, and food. Because we can't actually tackle those in sequence, um, I'm going to ask Paul to describe different nations. But first, uh, um, he's going to describe what is called the demographic transition, which is, until very recently, has been a universal phenomenon that has uh, traveled around the globe over last, you'd say, 250 More years? Less, yeah. Okay, over the last 200 years or so, and where we are now. So we're gonna start with a snapshot, then drill down into the demographic situations of particular nations. Okay, so Paul, please go ahead. Well, it's interesting that regimes are often understood as they die. So there was a regime which applied everywhere at all times, just about. And it was first captured by Thomas Malthus in his essay on population, uh, first published in the 1790s. Subsequent editions uh, were published in the 19th century. And the world that Malthus described was a world that he thought was perennial. It could never change. It would always be thus. And that was the world where we had essentially high mortality and high fertility, people breeding like rabbits, dying like flies. Women could not control their own fertility. Women who were not taken out of the pool of breeders, one way or another, would have six or seven children on average each, some more, some fewer. Some societies controlled this by having nunneries. Some engaged in primitive forms of contraception. But essentially, a woman would have six or seven children. Now, if you do the maths and you think, two people, six children every 25 years, we'd have had a population, starting, say, at a quarter of a billion the days of Julius Caesar, we'd have had hundreds of billions by the year 500. That couldn't happen, because as well as high fertility, you have high mortality. Two thirds of kids never making it to reproductive age themselves. And that is the regime you live in. Sometimes crops are good, times are good, more kids survive, more people breed, population goes up, and then it gets knocked back. Because the planet could not possibly sustain hundreds of billions of people. If war doesn't get you, or famine, or disease doesn't get you, ultimately, the you'll be up against that malthusian capacity and your population will be knocked back, the uh, Black Death being the famous example. So that we now know is not eternity, it's what we now call stage one of the demographic transition. That's demographic prehistory. What then happens is you get modernity, rising incomes, better, better um, diets, education, all the <clears throat> panoply of, of modernity and along with that, people have a falling mortality rate. You keep your kids alive longer, you survive longer in age. <clears throat> While you're still having that high fertility rate, high fertility, low mortality, we're in stage two, and that involves massive population expansion. Britain was the first off the block from about the time that Thomas Malthus was writing, from about 1800. Britain's population quadrupled in 100 years in the 19th century almost, despite the fact we were sending huge numbers of people out to the wider world, to Canada, to Australia. So phase two is high fertility persisting, mortality falls, population grows. Stage three then is when people actually find the means to control their own fertility. 
through later marriage, through contraception, um, and that sort of often spreads down in a society. The wealthy can, uh, the people who have the education, the means to access contraception, and eventually your fertility rate falls as well as your mortality rate, and that's phase three. Finally, you're in a phase where you have low fertility, low mortality, and the population is higher but stabilizes. That started in about 1800, as I said, in Britain. France is a special case. It goes around the world. So that while Britain was having a slower population growth by the early 20th century, fertility rates of three per woman, say by 1914, two per woman by um, 1939, a bit of an uptick after the war, famous baby boom. Um, but essentially, we were in a low fertility, low mortality phase with a large but flat population. As countries developed, they went through the same, through the same process and we saw massive population growth. <laughs> Two little footnotes on that then, which are actually quite important. The first is that this is driven by material conditions, but it's happening sooner and sooner. So you get countries like India, still quite poor, very early in their development, getting to a fertility rate of two, and a life expectancy of 70. So because people put resources, more and more global institutions put resources more and more into controlling, helping people control their own fertility and helping them live longer, quite poor countries are getting through this very rapidly now. So the whole world pretty much, except sub-Saharan Africa, is now in a phase of uh, reasonably long life expectancy and reasonably low fertility rate. So that's one thing, that it's material, but it's coming earlier than it used to in terms of material development. Then the next thing is what happens after that? Britain has been there for a long time. The developed world has been there for a long time. What then happens? What seems to happen is everywhere life expectancy is fairly long. What really matters then is what happens to fertility rates. And that is no longer determined by material conditions, it's determined by culture, some talk of a second demographic transition. And you get fully developed countries with a span of fertility rates ranging, say, from South Korea, where fertility rates are 0.8. The average couple has three, just, just now probably more like three quarters of a child. Each cohort massively smaller than the last. Run that forward, see what it means. Israel has a fertility rate of three children per woman. That's the highest in the developed world. And the really big question now in demography is, number one, how quickly sub-Saharan Africa will get through its transition, and number two, where the rest of us, the developed world, increasingly more and more of the world counts as developed, where are we going to end up? We know we'll have long life expectancy. Where are we going to end up on the fertility uh, spectrum? I wanted to go back to the point, your footnote, about how there is a delinkage now between economic development and fertility rates, and that they're now falling even in countries which are less developed, even in parts of Africa, and as you said, India, and, and poorer countries. You said it was due to culture. Is it because of technology, the dissemination of the availability of information and cultural, um, how do you say, um, TV shows, or what is that? What does that do to? The rapid fall in mortality is due to the fact that we are putting more resources into helping women keep their children alive. Right, right. That women, even when they get a fairly basic education, going from nothing to just primary school education, you're much better at being able to keep your child alive. So, the more, and, and, and just the growth of, of, of accessible pharmaceuticals and the whole, sure. the whole healthcare thing, is, it, that's a material thing, is driving poorer and poorer countries to be able to keep their people healthy and alive for longer. So then the question is, what about the fertility? Why is fertility falling so rapidly in countries like India, in countries like Thailand, which is still fairly poor? And I would say there are two things. There's first of all, again, the role of international agencies in spreading contraception and making it available. And in fairly basic education, which allows people to be able to use it, we all think it's so simple you could use it anyway. But the idea of using contraception, the idea of planning your family, goes along with a certain level of education. But the other thing you're absolutely right is cultural change. A uh, very interesting study done in Brazil, and it's been repeated elsewhere. When the television arrived, people thought, well, that was associated with the fall in fertility rates, and indeed it was. And there were these jokes about, oh, people have got better things to do in the evening and make babies. <laughs> actually, this is wrong, because you don't actually need a very large amount of sex to have a large family. Um, the 
what's really going on, when they looked at what the television programmes were that seemed to be having this effect, it was the soaps. And Brazil's famous for its love of soaps. It was presenting people who were quite poor. You can, you can live in a favela or even a village and have access to a television in a way today that you wouldn't have had 60 or 70 years ago. And you see the aspirational lifestyle of the soap, the glamorous woman in designer clothes, the cars, the apartments. Now, that's obviously out of the reach of a lot of people, but it's a very aspirate, materially aspirational message. And there seems to be a very strong correlation between availability and viewing of those soaps and a fall in uh, the fertility rate. And it's not just about soaps, but it is, as you say, the opening up of people in quite poor and what would have been quite remote communities to the internet, uh, the, 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 the global culture, does seem to be associated with falling fertility rates, even when their levels of prosperity are still fairly low. Now, if you take that uh, global trend of uh, declining fertility rates, even in, in, all, in all countries, basically, and going back to the theme of sustainability, are we facing an existential crisis where actually the human race might disappear? That sounds ridiculous, but I mean, if we just extrapolate, it's, I think it's not a crazy question. It isn't a crazy question because more and more countries are going sub-replacement fertility. That means fewer than two and a bit children per woman. This seems to be a very, very strong trend. And if you see a trend like that, year after year, country after country is falling below replacement. And if you see how very rare it is for a country to go from sub-replacement to back up over to replacement. It does seem that we are very clearly on a trend where the vast majority of humanity is going to be living in societies that have fewer than two children per woman. Down as low as 0.8 in Korea, we couldn't even have imagined that at one point, and that seems to be sinking. Britain, for a long time, we've been sub-replacement since the early 70s, but again going from a long period of bob bobbing around 1.8, 1.9 to 1.5, 1.6. This seems to be a global trend, and if it does continue, each cohort will eventually be smaller than the last, and eventually humanity would disappear. And I think there are two reasons why I don't think that will happen. But I do think we should be concerned about it, and we should be concerned about it in particular areas. The first reason is I think there are cultures which are very pronatal, where people have very large numbers of children. And those cultures seem to be quite successful, some of them, not only in having large families, but retaining those families within the fold. And those groups, although very small, will grow exponentially. So there are pronatal cultures that seem to be resisting this trend. Too small yet to move the dial, but if they stick to uh, their current practices and they manage to have very low attrition, they will grow a lot. There is also a, a belief, although it's not yet very well-founded, that there could be a pronatal, not just culture, but gene. And that historically people have had children because they had no choice, and then eventually they had children because there was massive social pressure, it's just what you did. In today's world where we live in a uh, society of great choice and great personal autonomy, lots of people will choose not to have children at all, that seems to be happening. And those people perhaps are people who are genetically predisposed to be antenatal or not to have a pronatal desire. And eventually we'll get to a bottleneck and we'll have a society where that gene has effectively bred itself out and the people who are left are genetically pronatal. That's quite controversial. It's not clear, but there seems to be some indication. That's very it. controversial. So You don't even mention that in your book. Um, <laughs> I do mention it in the next book. Um, <laughs> the next book, which, by the way, is out in the summer, I hope. Um, I was going to call it Procreate or Perish, um, but my, my, <laughs> uh, my, my publisher has suggested No One Left would be a better title, maybe with a question mark. So I think the point is, I do believe that ultimately humanity will replenish itself, but we can see clear trends and very strong trends in certain places where each, I mean, if you think of Korea, each cohort is a third of the size of the last one, run that forward a couple of generations, try running a school, try running a business, try running any kind of institution, and it's very hard to see how society survives. The Prime Minister of Japan, country with very low fertility rates for a long time, talks about uh, civilizational collapse. So I think it's not as if I think when we get it, it'll be an easy path. I think we will survive as a human race, but I think whether it's through a cultural bottleneck or a genetic bottleneck or both, that bottleneck's going to be very painful.
Okay, actually, you mentioned Japan, um, and <coughs> I think it's a very, it's one of the most important ch chapters or themes in your book or, or subjects, because what's happening in Japan is, is prefiguring what is going to happen potentially in most European countries. So tell us about that and what declining fertility has done to the country, to the culture, to the economy, uh, and the dilemmas that the government is, fa that the society is facing there. So Japan has had a low fertility rate below replacement about as long as we have in Britain. But the difference is where was we bobbed along at 1.8, 1.9 for a very long time. They went down much lower than that. And that's one thing about Japan. The other thing is Japan has chosen not to have mass immigration. So Japan is now facing a problem not only of an annually declining population, but of a rapidly aging population, more and more people of retirement age to people of workers. And let me give you one statistic, if I may. In the 1960s, when Japan reached 100 million people, there were five to six people of working age for every one retiree, five or six to one. When it gets back down to 100 million in the 2030s or 2040s, it will be almost one for one. So imagine a society where one worker has to pay tax and support one retiree. We've never seen societies like that. What it means in the case of Japan is huge rural depopulation is already happening. And the government is, unsurprisingly, having huge challenges to meet the pensions and healthcare requirements. And 80-something requires five, six, seven times as much spend on healthcare as a 20-something. So as your society has fewer young people paying taxes, more and more old people um, requiring that kind of support, it gets harder and harder to keep your fi the financial side of things going, the labor market side of things going. So, the big difference between Japan and Western Europe is that the, not only has Japan had it longer and, and harder than we have, but the Japanese have largely avoided mass immigration. So I, I've talked about this trilemma that countries face. Essentially, you can have low fertility rates. You can have a community that doesn't require mass immigration and ethnic change and you can have a booming economy, or at least a sustainable economy. You can't have all three. In Britain, we've chosen to have small families, but to keep our, our old age homes and our healthcare manned, and that's required massive immigration and uh, ethnic change. In Japan, they've also kept their families small, even smaller, they don't want immigration. And I think we're only at the start, we're only at the cusp of really seeing the huge aging of Japan and the decline of its population in a way that no society has ever seen before, short of something like the Black Death coming along, and this could be even sharper than that. Um, now, would you say, therefore, contrasting the UK, you also point out in your book that Germany is also aging rapidly and on track to lose 40% of its current population by 2050. So why don't, uh, and they are, they've also had a lot of immigration. Compare that to the UK context. Well, the difference in Germany, again, is that like Britain, it went sub-replacement in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. But the difference is it never had the post-war baby boom that we had, nothing to the same extent. That the decline of communism in the East and the collapse of uh, the GDR had a tremendously negative effect on the fertility rate in Germany. Um, the other thing we've seen in Germany, we have seen mass immigration similar to uh, the, the, what we've seen in Britain. But what we're now seeing in Germany, both on the right with the Alternative for Deutschland and actually the emerging anti-immigrant or anti-immigration left, is a real pushback to the idea that it's fine if society ends up with a totally different ethnic mix um, from what was historically known. So I think there is a political reaction in Germany which we're starting to see, and maybe we've only just seen the beginning of. That's partly to do with a different political culture. It's also partly to do with the fact, and this perhaps is off track, that with our one pass, first past the post party system, it's very hard for parties of the far left or far right to get moving in Britain. And one of the things that I feel very strongly, I am trying to get the message out to people when we talk about immigration, is on the question of this trilemma, we need to understand that immigration has been effectively fueled by the indigenous population's reluctance to have larger families. On the one hand, and its demand for labor on the other. And I think it's much better to have this debate in a rational environment. I have got criticized both from the left and from the right 
for raising this. There are people on the left who say even to question that immigration, endless massive immigration is a good thing, is unacceptable. And there are people on the right who say, you know, well, there's some dark conspiracy somewhere flooding our country with foreigners. And what I'm trying to say is, if you understand the demography, we have choices to make as a society. Do we want to go the Japanese route of effective depopulation and economic decline? And Japan was once the land of the rising sun. Its economy has massively declined. Its inventiveness has declined. Do we want to have endless immigration? And I think that itself is problematic because we've had mass immigration from Ireland and Poland, Ireland traditionally, Poland more recently, countries which now have low fertility rates and are getting more and more prosperous. The idea that we can forever attract relatively highly educated people to these islands is probably a false belief. So we, we're used to being a very wealthy country compared to the rest of the world. We're used to people wanting to come here. We're not necessarily going to have that forever. So I, what I'm trying to say is that there will be real consequences if we don't manage to get our fertility rate up. What um, countries have been able to reverse declining fertility successfully? Has that even happened in the last 50 years? I mean, it, it is a great rarity. There are a few exceptional cases. I mentioned Israel, a very special case where fertility, I mean, it's an interesting case. You had Jews um, expelled from the Arab lands who came to Israel in the 50s and 60s, had a very high fertility rate, but that rapidly dropped. You had Jews who'd come from Europe who had a low fertility rate. It was heading for a classic low fertility rate country. And then something changed. And from the 90s, the fertility rate went up to three. Uh, Israel is clearly a very special case in terms of the kinds of pressures it's under. Its Arab population, 20% Arab population, has seen a more classic fall in fertility rate towards the national average. Georgia was a very interesting case where it has recovered, not because of the action of the government, but it would seem the action of the church, where the archbishop um, or, or the head of the Georgian church s saw this as a problem and said, I will personally baptise, I think, the third child in any marriage. Um, and that does seem to have had a... <laughs> had a <laughs> I wrote, I wrote in my book that I'm not sure Justin Welby would have quite the same effect on the national <laughs> fertility rate in Britain, but it might be worth a try. Um, and the other case is Hungary, where they've thrown the, a huge amount of money and resources at getting the fertility rate up by encouraging people to take loans for their children, which are then written off if they have more children, <coughs> very generous um, maternity and paternity leave. They, they've thrown all the classic tools. And they have got the fertility rate up from about 1.2 to 1.5 or 6. The problem is that other countries in Eastern Europe seem to have done that as well. We have seen a, a trend in Eastern Europe of the fertility rate to go up from one, about 1.2 to about 1.5, 1.6. That's probably because, this is a demographer's technicality, when a whole cohort is delaying its, its childbearing, the fertility rate looks artificially depressed. When that ends and people can't delay it forever, um, or when that slows down, you then end up with a fertility rate that goes back up to normality. If you're actually looking at the fertility of completed cohorts, what you'd actually see is something much smoother, but actually it goes down and up when people are delaying their fertility. So I think my point about Hungary is they throw in the kitchen sink at the problem, and it's not obvious that they've done any better than, say, the Czech Republic or Romania, which have not had all these policies. I'm dubious about the ability of government through throwing money at the problem to achieve a result. Okay, so actually, um, in one of your interviews, you, you propose that we need to foster a pronatal culture. Now, what did you actually mean by that? What I mean is that when you ask women how many children they want to have, they generally say about, I mean, the average is 2.5. I'm sure no woman says 2.5. But, <laughs> but you average it out at about 2. Point, but somewhere between 2.3 and 2.5. And that's pretty normal for most of um, the developed world. And um, the question is, why are they not having those children? And the answer is, very often we're told, can't afford it, property's too expensive, housing's too expensive, childcare's too expensive. Now, we're a wealthier society than ever. The, the wealthier countries get, the lower their fertility gets. And if you look around the world today, it's wealthier countries that have lower fertility. So if we have more resources as a society than ever, but we feel we can't afford to have children, then it's about our priorities. It's about what we want to do with our lives, what our highest priorities are. And although we say we want to have children, it's just not a high enough priority. Now, if government spends money or not, the fertility rate will rise if the priority, the priorities of people um, to have children is a higher, higher in, their, in the lists of things they want to do. Now, how do you change that? Well, 
I'm going to be 60 in November. Um, I'm probably the last person, well, not the last person, but I'm not the first person you should be asking how to change the culture. But I do think that for people in their 20s and 30s, they need to have role models of people who put having children um, high on their list of priorities. People I talk about, Prince William, David Beckham, obviously people who've not got financial constraints, but they are both men who have chosen to marry relatively early, stick by their wives, have some children, bring them up, um, four and three respectively. So that's one idea, uh, to, to heighten those role models. Um, the other thing is the fall off of fertility of women, particularly in their 30s, is something that I don't think is well understood. And if it was taught in biology classes, if people had in their head at school a model of, if I want children, this is what the drop off in my, this is how I have to think about planning my life, uh, then I think we would have fewer women who actually do want children and have the heartache of never managing to have them. Okay. That's just two suggestions, I mean, but, but younger, hipper people would have much better ideas than me. <laughs> we could, that's a good uh, question for a manifesto for Essex. I don't know. The Youth Climate Summit next time. Okay, so it's pretty stark, though, this dilemma. We either follow the path of Japan or Israel, uh, and we have to choose immigration or foster a more pronatal pro culture if we're going to actually stem pop population decline or p this problem of population replacement. Now, now I want to tr move to a slightly different tack and, and in, inside the UK. I, be, one of the biggest trends identified by you is urbanization, that it seems to be inexorable. It's less... Uh, pronounced in the UK, but you use this excellent example of Stoke-on-Trent and the depopulation of that city over a span of about 20 years. Can you tell us what's happening in the UK? Because all too often we can actually see it in the towns surrounding where we live, uh, surrounding this museum, for example. So the, the, the trend of urbanisation is not so pronounced in the UK because we got there very early. I think we were just about the first country which was majority urban, however defined, from the 1850s. <coughs> so Britain is, is historically a very urban society. But if you look at some of our towns, particularly the towns which seem to be doing not so well, what's happening is a huge shift from a younger population to an older population. If you actually looked at the ratios of, of say, the under-15s in Stoke to the over-60s, I don't have my, the, the data to hand, but it's quite shocking. And I think where you have an older town, I mean, I celebrate um, people living longer. My own mother's 90, which is fantastic. I'd be very happy if I lived that long. And, you know, I think we should honour our older people. But if we're not reproducing enough younger people, that is going to show itself in some places. Some towns will be concentrations of youth. They may have universities. They may have the sorts of industries or jobs that attract young people. But if there are only so many young people to go around, you are going to have small towns that suffer with older populations often are often pensioners, often on limited income, a lack of jobs, a lack of amenities, a lack of culture, which of course creates its own cycle, which makes the place unattractive to uh, younger people. And that's how towns die. They age and they die. We see, we see that in parts of the UK. We see it in parts of the US. The population, it's like a mini and extreme version of the country as a whole. First, the population gets much older, uh, the business is shut, uh, the place becomes rather depressing, and then the population declines altogether. And that is, that's happening first and fastest in a country like the UK, but other developed countries as well, in those small towns which are not university towns and um, which don't have the sorts of industries that are attracting younger people. Okay, now I'm going to go to a completely different but super important subject of Africa. Now, Paul, you can only talk about that literally for two minutes, but do talk, because it is actually one of the most, uh, one of the most important megatrends uh, of current civilization. So t t in a snapshot, tell us what is on track to happen in Africa and how it's going to affect us, affect global culture and the world. Being the poorest and least developed part of the world, it's the earliest in its transition. Parts of Africa are getting much longer life expectancy and much lower fertility rates. Kenya, Ethiopia, South Africa's long had a low fertility rate. Parts of Africa still have six, seven children per, women, per woman, a very high fertility, but now gradually um, increasing life expectancy and falling in the mortality. And that means that sub-Saharan Africa will go from about 7% of the global population circa 1950 to about 35% at the end of this century. 
century. I can't tell you exactly what that will mean in terms of culture and in terms of economics and in terms of geopolitics. But I do think if you go from that continent being 7% of the world's population to well over a third, it's going to be an extremely different world in all those dimensions. And watching how the world transforms as it becomes more African will be fascinating. Okay, and that's going to be, tell us really another very quickly. That will depend on Africa's ability to reap the demographic dividend. So explain that. So the demographic dividend is when you have got lots of people in their 20s and 30s because you've had that big expansion in the past. Those people are starting to have smaller families themselves. Fertility rate goes down. So population grows more slowly. That's the time when you've got all those 20 or 30 somethings entering the workforce not burdened by huge numbers of children themselves, that's when the economy takes off. That's a great opportunity. Countries like Indonesia have grasped that opportunity. Korea, when it was there, is very much associated with economic growth, with prosperity. Africa's got that opportunity ahead of it, but countries don't always take it. Much of the Middle East is there at the moment and is not grasping it because of political problems. You need a degree of political stability and peace in order to reap the opportunities that the demographic dividend presents you with. Okay, that is a very dense, intense download. I hope some of that, you, you retain some of it, but do, the book is fantastic. Now we're gonna open the floor to questions. Okay, that person <coughs> on the stairway, stairway there. Hi, thanks for that. I came in, I admit, 10 minutes late, sorry about that, so I may have missed something crucial, but on the back of hopefully having not missed anything crucial. My question is, is it a tiny bit irresponsible to talk about increasing um, the birth rate in a climate and ecological emergency? Thank you. I think that's a very good question, and I am appreciative of the fact that human population is pushing up against the bounds of what the population, of, of what the planet can sustain. But I think we have to be very careful if we think that the future is going to be in super low fertility like Korea, and there are a number of reasons for that. And that's the way, way we're heading. Number one, you don't just get a smaller human population, you get a massively old population, which is very difficult to support for the re financial and labor force reasons that we've talked about. Number two, I think the solutions to our, to our ecological problems are going to come from bright young people and their genius and inventiveness. And if you look at a country like Japan, which has aged rapidly, its inventiveness, its patents, for example, is a good way of quantifying this, are falling. So I think an, a, a shrinking, ageing global population will not be able to come up with the solutions to the environmental problems that we have. The last point I would make is that if you are living in the West or the developed world, consuming the labour of others, so you expect a bus driver at the bus stop, you expect someone to look after you in the old age home, or your mum, someone to tile your roof. In other words, you're consuming labour, but you think, for the globe, I'm not going to have children. What you're effectively doing is you're consuming the labour that you're not prepared to produce, and that if it's going to be there, it's only going to be there because other people in poorer parts of the world are having those children, and those children are then moving from low emissions countries to high emissions countries. So while you think you're being very virtuous in not filling the planet full of emitters, you're actually just moving people from low to high emissions regions. I think the last thing I would say on, on that um, is that if you look at a child born today in a developed country, children make very little difference in terms of emissions. In 20 years' time, if we are able to move towards a, uh, a zero emission society, that child will probably have very little effect on, uh, at least on CO2 emissions. That was a very cogent answer, Paul, wow. <laughs> anyway, the main, I think the upshot of that is that it sounds so s simple to just not have a child, but it's actually could be even more of a crushing burden on Gen Z than it is now, not to have any children. Um, up there, oh no, we already asked, oh, Andrew up there above Damien. <laughs> How much of a reduction in fertility is due to uh, housing and education costs? So when you see, as in Japan, housing costs beginning to fall because of the demographics, are you seeing a response in the fertility rate? A, a very good question. And I think if you ask people why you're not having children, the expense of housing and of um, <coughs> not so much education, but childcare, where, where education tends to be free, child, yeah, young childcare is often thrown up as an example of why people, or, or a reason why people won't have children. And the 
ultimate response to that is that if you look at parts of the UK where housing is cheap, relatively cheap, particularly parts of Scotland, if you look at countries where childcare is massively subsidised, such as in Germany, you still have a very low fertility rate. And Japan, indeed, the house, cost of housing has fallen and the fertility rate has not picked up. So I think we absolutely should be helping young people get on. I'd say the housing ladder, I think that is an old-fashioned term. We should be helping young people start families earlier with, with assistance in housing, building houses and childcare. But I do not think that that is going to solve the problem. And I think if we had free, excellent childcare tomorrow and a, a big drop in the property prices, I don't believe without a cultural shift that we're going to end up with a rise in the fertility rate. Okay, next question. Okay, that young lady there, I'm asking all the young people. I because it's, this is one of the, this is affecting um, them. I'm in my 20s and I'm a biology student. And over the past, well, study years, we've been taught that there is an overpopulation and that the earth cannot support um, us as humans anymore. Therefore, a lot of people my age um, are telling that we are not going to have children because of that. What is your response to that? Oh, we just answered that question. So I, I, I apologize, but we have to move on to somebody else. This person here, sorry. Paul can answer your question again in the hall. Over here. I do think perception lags reality, by the way. So uh, update your view of the world would be my answer. Hello. <laughs> um, following on from the previous questions, is earlier you spoke of genetics playing a part and how that might uh, sort of die off in the future. Um, there's a massive part for myself. I'm also 27. Um, I'm a marine biologist at Essex, actually. Um, well, undergraduate. <laughs> um, and I feel a massive responsibility, obviously, looking at children. That There's millions of children in the UK that can't afford to eat. Um, and you think... I don't want to have children because I don't know what their future might hold. Um, what do you think of that? When I was born, the world had just pulled out of the um, Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, was supposedly on the edge of destruction. I'm very pleased that that didn't stop my parents having me. Um, when my, parent, my mother was born in the year that Hitler came to power, my father was born in the year Mussolini came to power, and he was born in Germany, and there was a huge inflation going on after the First World War. And if I go back to the time my grandparents were born, all before the First World War, there were impending disasters everywhere. So if we're going to wait to have children until the world is perfect, we'll never have any. Uh, there's no doubt if you just look at the data, we have lower infant mortality. Now, when I, was, when I was born, the infant mortality rate, even in Britain, was 20 to 25 per thousand. It's now four or five or six. So, so, we've had ma so in other words, people are massively better fed. They're much less likely to die young. Uh, there's so much to be positive about. It seems that as things get better, we get more miserable about the prospects for our children. I'm pleased that my parents had me. Uh, maybe some in the room aren't, I don't know, but I'm pleased my parents had me. And you should likewise contemplate what was the world like when you were conceived and were your parents wise. That gentleman in the blue sweater. What's your prognosis on China over the next 20 years? Good one. China is a huge... China really is the elephant in the room, not me. Um, China... China had this crazy one-child policy. I don't think it had that much effect, because if you look at the Chinese outside China and Taiwan, Southeast Asia, their fertility rate dropped enormously. Fertility rates were falling like a stone in China before 1980, so it was a wicked and unnecessary policy. And it's now impossible to reverse it anyway. They're raising the limits. People don't want to have children. A country that has very rapid economic development like China, that has no... Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, interestingly, again like China, is a country that ends up with very, very low fertility. They're already having a falling population, a massively aging population. I think this is going to wreak havoc with China over the next 20 years, to, to answer your question. Okay, that lady there, that's good to be the last question. Thank you. It um, seems to me that the crux of your argument is um, nationalistic, so that um, you know, we need to um, increase labour skills for particular places and countries to compete with each other. But what about if we open borders, increase international adoption, um, and increase the um, education of essential skills in areas so that we don't 
have to wait until children grow up and get educated. You know, so why, why is it, I mean, is there, is that the crux of your argument? And, and why do we have to be so nationalistic? I don't think it's necessarily being nationalistic. When, we, when I was in Korea, um, I, or when I'm in Tunisia, which I haven't been to, but, but if I go, to say to the local people, you know, as wise white man from Europe, don't worry about, about your fertility rate. You can just ship other people's children in. Uh, Korean cultures have no long-term value. Tunisian cultures... These are countries where both of which they've resisted or objected to immigration. So not for us to go around the world telling other nations and nationalities and races to be good white cosmopolitans like we are. So that's one argument. I, the second argument is I think it's deeply important moral for countries like Britain, which are wealthy, to say we're very important, we're very rich, we're very busy, you dear third world developing, you go and have the children, you go through the pain, you go spend the hours bringing them up, you go through the expense of educating them, you even go to the expense of making, making them, for example, medical professionals, and then as we want them, we'll come and um, and sort of in some kind of biological imperialistic way, we'll pick them up. Of course, immigration is very important, and of course, we've re relied on it and will continue to rely on it. But I think to say to non European peoples, you've got to be good cosmop cosmopolitans and not worry. And I think for us ourselves to say we'll just sweep up people because we're too busy to have our own children is not, certainly not the way I would like to see the world run. Finally, in Britain, I've read, I haven't got very good data on it, that there are more Ghanaian health workers than there are in Ghana. We have much better health care than in Ghana. And I think to just think we can keep sweeping people in from countries like Ghana when they're, when they're educated and, and their own parents and their own society have gone through the, all the, the, the expense that we can then take them, I think is a deeply immoral thing to do. Okay, that's it. Uh, that was fantastic, Paul. That Thank was really amazing. Okay, you can meet Paul in the corridor.